die, Carter. He's nothing left. Ever since I was a child, I had a feeling that something is missing in me. I want to know why I'm here. Can any of us know that? Become yourself. Then God and the devil don't matter. I want to learn. I want to understand. Be careful. Can you find the force to enable these two quite opposite lines to live together in your soul? At any moment, the wolf can devour the land. And you must learn what it means to become responsible. This is an exact I'm the foreknown history to the unknown future. This is Red Ice Radio for the seeker. Must try to know. Hello, everyone. This is Red Ice Radio. I'm Henrik Palmgren. Welcome back to another program. And if you're new to all of this, please take a look at RedIceCreations.com for more on what we do. Today, we're talking with Frank Collins. He is an author, philosopher and a knowledge architect, having developed many websites on global issues and solutions. About uh, 25 years ago, Frank started collecting and working on the ideas that eventually became the website Eucadia.com. Since then, Frank has completed a range of books, patents and models covering a vast area of subjects. Frank's current focus is finishing the 22 books of canon law based on the Restore the Law project, aimed at challenging the root of Roman Vatican law. Today we'll discuss who is at the apex of the Pyramid of Control, the new Pope, some history on the Illuminati, and what Frank sees as being the rise of nihilism. Welcome back, Frank. Uh, Good to talk to you again. I think it's been about a year and a half since we last talked, and and as I was thinking about it, it felt like it was been, I don't know, seven, eight months maybe in quote-unquote normal time. Uh, (laughs) A lot has certainly been going on, but anyway, good to have you back, uh, Frank. Hope you're doing well. No, thank you very much, Henrik. And again, it's an honor to speak with you again. Definitely. A lot of things has been happening. And, and uh, I think we should begin talking a little bit about some of the changes in the in the Vatican, obviously, since this is one of your uh, prime subjects, as it were. Um, a new pope has been um, put in place. Uh, <laughs> your initial thoughts and comments on this, Frank? Well, I, thank you. And I, I, I know that there's been a lot spoken already about the coming of Pope Francis, the first uh, Pope named Pope Francis, but yeah, I believe it is an extraordinary, extraordinary event because for what I know at least, it heralds a fundamental shift in the direction of the hierarchy, indeed within the Illuminati, away from the history of the Roman cult and indeed drawing a line in the sand as to the end of the Roman cult, both legally and morally, and an attempt to redirect this enormous ship towards what's known as the Holy See, towards uh, different waters. And what I'm referring to is the incredible symbolism both in the naming of the Pope, in the fact that the Pope did not in any way associate himself with the trappings of the Supreme Pontiff, Mm -hmm. in the outright rejection that he has made since taking office as to any reference of him being the Pontiff and rather to be known as the Bishop of Rome or or the Vicar, or the uh, father, and even to dissuade people from calling him Holy Father. To me, there are unmistakable signs throughout the events that prove 
the elite have recognized spiritually, morally, historically, the line in the sand came about and we have seen and witnessed the end of the Roman cult 1,260 years plus or minus a year to the founding of the Catholic Church. An incredible event. Uh, tell us a little bit more about this, how you view this symbolically, because the way I've seen it always is that the Pope is a kind of a, uh, sure, it's it's highly symbolic within there, but is it not, after all, just kind of a, a puppet? Is it not, well, what I've heard anyway is that you have the uh, the Black Pope being the real power, the, uh, you know, the, the head honcho of the, uh, you know, the Jesuits. In this case, we have Adolfo uh, Nicolas uh, from from Spain being that. So what do you what do you make of this with the with the Pope and, and sim- symbolically him being, you know, taken out and a new one is in place now? Well, yeah, I mean, f- f- first off, I hope we get later the chance to, to actually talk about the rise of nihilism and the fact that the system at the coalface is broken when we talk about the courts, health, politics, military, but at the top of the pyramid, the Pope does still hold some incredible power. And and you are correct that the role of the Pope shifted. It shifted significantly when the Jesuits themselves were formed in the 16th century and a string of papal bulls were issued under the direction of Venetian and ex pisan families that really shifted that power to the Jesuits. But since the 60s and the reformation of the Illuminati into a complete and holistic body, I mean all the elite of the world, the top of the pyramid into one cohesive body since 1961, mm. The real power is not in the superior general. The superior general is a general. And what people, for for whatever reason, fail to, maybe it's because we all view hardware and military and guns and planes as as real power. It's not. It's, it's, It's soft power. Hard power in a system based on knowledge are teachers, philosophers, theologians, they are and have been the central power. So it is not the superior general, it is the leading teachers within the Jesuit order that have and have always possessed the power. And I'll give you an example of that. You think about the ancient history we were taught about Rome. We were taught that the provinces, the provincia of the Roman Empire were run by governors. Yeah? Mm-hmm. Well, the word governor didn't exist. The, the position of governor didn't exist. That's a modern paint over. That's a hiding of history. The head of a province was called the rector in the Roman Empire. You ever heard the word rector before? That's what uh, they call a, a principal in Sweden. They used that same very word, rector. Yeah, so I've heard it. Right. So, so it is the heads of the elite institutions that hold the real material power within the Jesuit structure and therefore within the Illuminati. It's not those that hold an operational or indeed a quasi-military function. I mean, that's it's a difference. If you want to know the difference, it's a difference between, for example, a chairman and a chief operations officer. Yeah. Uh, that's the difference. I, I know in the case of... Um... I think it's the, the the Vatican in a way. They have something they called um, kind of the Grey Cardinal or the Grey Eminence. He, you know, an advisor, a powerful decision decision maker, kind of behind the scenes, if you will. Well, there is a there is a cardinal connected to the sovereign knights of Malta. Yes, uh, but the the interesting thing is, while the while the most powerful um, position in the world being the head of the Illuminati, is appointed by the Pope. Once appointed, then the pyramid inverts, and that role becomes the most powerful influence 
in the world. And it's not an influence in terms, as I say, operational uh, personnel. It is in the direction, the theme, the thought, the idea. And that's what we've seen in the changes in the world since there was a recognition by the elite that the prophecies of Malachi, the prophecies built within the Hasidic and uh, within the Sabbatean beliefs, the Zohar, all of this had to be brought to bear. All this had to come to fruition if there was to be any future. And so they recognized that and they have changed their history according to that. And the history itself for 99.99% of people out there, sadly, would not know that the true Catholic Church, we spoke about this months ago, was not formed 2,000 years ago. Christianity was only formed 1,700 years ago by Constantine. And Catholicism was formed in the 8th century through the uh, Carolingians, through Charles Martel, the grandfather of the famous figure Charlemagne. Mm. And so that is the true founding of the Catholic Church as the good Christian knights. And so we're witnessing the rebirth of the true Catholic Church in repudiation of the Mithraic, Persian-influenced Roman cult. I mean, it's incredible to watch, incredible. Hmm. Describe that a little bit more to us, how you how you see that you basically what you're saying is that they're more, more open about it now than, than ever before, correct? Well, it is, it is a recognition that revelation, true, true revelation has a manifest importance in global affairs and that it is not simply a weapon and a tool to maintain power. It is and it has been a weapon. I mean, the prophecies of Malachi are one of the most horrendous frauds in people trying to manipulate who should be the next pope. And you can imagine how this has been used by people to to do that. It's been around for hundreds of years. So, so you're and saying it's just a fraud? Well, well it, yes. Yes, it is. Because half the popes that are quoted in the prophecy of Malachi <clears throat> were were before the prophecy really came into being. And the remainder, the prophecy is less accurate. However, we are at a watershed where we have not only the mind prophecy, but we have the prophecy of the Zohar, which have been a massive influence in the history of the world over the last 500 years, in the sacrifice of the six. Uh, in the coming of a new age, in the transition of Rome. I mean, these prophecies of the Zohar have been behind two world wars, central to two world wars, and were le leading to be central for a third world war until the Illuminati ratted out the false uh, prophesiers who have been promoting this kind of prophecy. So to underestimate prophecy as a driving force to global events, I feel is, is terribly naive. They changed the history by bringing it to fulfillment. Rather than arguing that they didn't reach a point, arguing that, they, that the Roman cult would continue and that the, the system that was established under the Gregory a thousand years ago would continue, they recognized that they had to legally, morally, spiritually go back to basics. And they, and they are. They are absolutely doing that in the restructuring of the Vatican, in the appointment of Pope Francis, in the ending of the Roman cult, even though we haven't seen the effects of that because the system is so broken at the political, military, financial and legal level. Well, I definitely want to talk more about that. Uh, just a brief comment on this. I've always thought it was very difficult to determine 
if these uh, scriptures, you know, i.e. these that have been named to be prophecies or predictions, if they really are that or if they're simply actually being used more or less as a as a blueprint uh, written by someone at some point and then it's decided upon to be you know followed by the current order so that they can kind of take advantage of the of the prophetic power of them if you if you see what i mean frank i agree with you and and, and in fact it it's a bit of both you know when the zohar came about uh, what what made it significant it, it was the most provocative prophecy of any scripture really since the formation of christianity what well, people you know people believe because of evangelists and uh, movements like the mormons and others that that the world is flooded with prophecy and it is it's it's flooded with prediction it's flooded with claims but genuine revelation genuine revelation is extremely extremely rare so something that's and received from a higher source that's what you're saying unmistakable there is a provenance but more there is a hallmark of revelation that is the real deal that stands above all the fakery and the cheap fortune teller type claims that people put forward and, and I include in that and I might get in great trouble for doing that when people talk in some respect to Nostradamus. Nostradamus wrote a book according to a formula. I, I hope no one would ever claim that John and the Revelation, the book of Revelation, in anywhere can be compared as equal or that Nostradamus could be compared as equal to the extraordinary writings and revelations in the book of Revelation. So those that have studied and are obsessed in the occult, obsessed in genuine transmission of revelation, know the difference, even if many of us sadly takes a long time to get there. And you're right, knowledge of revelation and genuine revelation has influenced the world, both as a, as a weapon to power uh, and as a blueprint for events, and that's why I mentioned Zohar. Zohar has been the driving revelation for two world wars and the murder of all those people in World War II. It absolutely was. And we spoke about that last time, about the death camps and the pentagram. I mean, the very the very site that it was located, Palawi, the, the, the family whose palace, that the center of this 300 mile wild pentagram was formed, that family are the financial founders and sponsors of the entire Hasidic movement. The whole Ashkenazi movement, the people who made it, protected it, supported it and grew it from the time of Sabbatai V all the way through. That was their palace, the Katowski Palace in World War II. Now, you can't tell me that that's just a weird coincidence. Interesting. Yeah, we might want to return a little bit to that because I, I, uh, thinking back, uh, I don't recall that much from you know from uh, from those details talking about that. But we'll get back to it. I wanted to ask you a little bit about uh, basically what you mean by the rise of nihilism, and and I wanted to get into the politics of the Illuminati as well. Uh, you know, if they are where they are, I guess, in the political spectrum. But 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 first of all, the the rise of nihilism. Explain this uh, to our audience, Frank. Well, nihilism. Uh, really uh, is the belief that that there is no ultimate truth, uh, there is no ultimate morality, uh, that uh, we make it uh, ourselves, that the only truth is our intellect, the only truth uh, is our genius, and that we are architects of our own future. Now, you know, having been brought up uh, a Catholic and having discovered how so much of what we're told is just uh, indoctrination, and I mean, challenged that kind of theory, the, the nihilist theory or, or its more benign label, secularism, has a lot of appeal. I mean, it appeals because when you're looking at the malevolence and evil of so many of these groups behind war and torture and murder and, and think of all the, the terrible policies of the world today, like uh, against uh, use of... Uh, of uh, condoms and things in Africa, all these things that would make a huge impact 
positive impact that the church denies. It's very romantic and attractive to, to think of the rights and, and theories of Hegel and uh, Nietzsche and, and other writers, Sartre in France, that we are the architects of our future and that this idea that there's some old man with a white beard basically with a magnifying glass burning our legs off like some nasty school kid is just a, is just a lie. The problem of the nihilist movement, and I guess the problem whenever a, a romantic movement comes on, is it's gone beyond that. It's gone beyond just attacking that which was outrageously wrong and has set about remaking the world no longer to the ideals of Hume and Locke and, and, and the romantic movement and those behind the French Revolution, but to a point where it is now nothing more than about power. And by that I refer to the, the lies of nihilism through psychology, for example, where now the latest manual of psychology that comes out of America, the, the giant DSM, I think version five or six is coming out, pretty much identifies that every single man and woman, every child is born with technically severe mental illness <laughs> and thus they can use that against us. Well, this is madness. Another example of nihilism is economics, whereas economics initially, if you look at Adam Smith, was an attempt to quantify the way in which we could view the assets and values. Economics now is used to justify strip mining and deforestation and genetic modification and stripping of our rights. And law, oh, if there is an area that nihilists have absolutely run rampant and destroyed, it is the hypocrisy of law where corporations masquerading as real estate and de jure courts seek to make money, make money off law and deny, flat stick deny that they are creating securities and instruments and values and huge, huge volumes from shoving people through the courts, treating us as criminals and filling the jails. It's madness, yeah. absolute madness. Well, it's, so it's nihilism has not been addressed. Sorry. No, no worries. Uh, I just wanted to um, interject there and, and basically, you know, I, because I, I've seen this as well. And what, what I've what I currently see from my perspective is that it's being well, I call it sanctioned corruption. It's it's being allowed to be, uh, you know, run into the ground, pretty much the abuse of all these methodologies and sy systems to the point of absurdity now. And I think it's, you know, it, it's in order to push the system so far into absurdity that people will also you know want to reject it 180 degrees if you see what i mean this has been a uh, been a strategy kind of like uh with the aid of you you know you brought up the french revolution before and it's kind of a, the the same thing there it's kind of a, a fanaticism always being said that it's for uh you know egalitarianism and, and good and all for purposes it's like in its name come you know bloodshed and, and basically murder and you know <laughs> how does that go together you see what i mean well, I do, I do, but you know, let, let me give you three three examples of of the madness. It, it is, it's a bit like the analogy that that you know, one who deals in the deadly death of of uh, of uh, dangerous drugs when they start to take their own product, they start to, be, to 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 develop their own psychosis, and you know, when the propaganda starts to believe his or her own lies, and that's the problem is is that these groups like the political classes with the lobbyists have actually sealed themselves off from reality. They've sealed themselves off from the people so that when one joins that club, one enters a completely parallel world, a world that does not require nor need nor believe that logic has any value. And I'll give you three examples where nihilism has reached the point of the theatre of the absurd. And I'll give you an example. The first one is that nihilists say we don't believe in the existence of a divine creator. And you've heard that before, you know, sure. atheists. Yeah. Uh, an atheist is an example of nihilism, right? Yep. 
Well, what they fail to do is fail to, to realise that in their statement, they say it's logical, in the statement that, that I don't believe in God, you have just exposed yourself as infantile and in error. And the reason is this. In order to express the negative, there must be the concept to exist in the first place, that is, the concept of God. In order to repudiate God, there must logically first be the concept, the construct, in order to make it uh, repudiated, right? Yep. Yep. Now, whether God physically exists or not, if the concept exists, then at some level does God exist, at least in theory. Yeah, I see what you mean. Right. So if God exists, at least in theory, the argument that God doesn't exist absolutely is an absurdity. And see, this is the, this is the, this is the infantile logic of the nihilist that has been unchallenged around the world, that have made these great romantic outpourings to people to, to speak about injustice and rolled everything into one, rolled the history of power, rolled the history of, of malfeasance and, and wrapped it all up and, and sold it to the youth as some romantic quest, when really those that are promoting it are doing so for nothing more than power of its own accord. I'll give you one more example. Mm. The concept that uh, God does not exist, you know, and the concept that there is no meaning to life. I mean, the, the, the argument, the argument that Nilis used uh, that God doesn't exist uh, is simply that they create the construct and say, well, uh, in, 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 order for, in order for there to be a God, there must be something uh, of great complexity. They use their own prejudice and their own supposition as the, as the basis of the fallacy when they cannot see the simplicity of life. You know, anyone that has had a child, anyone that has a niece or nephew, godson, goddaughter, when you see the, the infant and you see the wondrous complexity of nature, knows that, that nature doesn't need us to prove its validity. We have so much to learn from nature. And, and the nihilist has become a prisoner of what their own ego believes is their intellectual brilliance. And this is the insanity that keeps feeding the system at the moment. It is not the Illuminati anymore. It is not the elite anymore. This system is feeding itself. And Congress and Senate in America is absolutely proof in point. Absolutely proof in point of what I'm saying. You know, it's funny if one of the tenets of nihilism is uncertainty or that one can't know anything, then there certainly are very sure, you know, uh, about certain things <laughs> along the way, which is kind of interesting, you know. We know yeah, this, I agree with you. you know? I, look, I, I, I believe that, for example, skepticism is a very healthy, health, very, very healthy discipline. Sure. But the nihilists presents themselves and they are pseudo-skeptics, false skeptics, because they do not approach things with the discipline of the uh, true logician. Logic, reason, absolutely fundamental. All that I have done with Eucadia has been with the tools of deductive reasoning, of logic. And so I, I absolutely see them as fundamental. But as I said, the, the nihilist, the, 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 the false skeptic, they, they take these and they corrupt them and they'll say, well, God is dead. I killed him. As, as Nietzsche did in, in complete arrogance and then won't realise the stupidity, the absolute stupidity that the concept has to exist in order for them to repudiate it. So there is this, look, I, as I say, I believe for us to, to free ourselves, to be emancipated, we must question, we must ask far more than we do, but we must do it recognising that just because something was invented 2,000 years ago doesn't necessarily make it broken and that we must approach things with the best possible tools and we must do it objectively. And the nihilists and the sceptics 
and the Fabians and all these groups that are out there promoting this romantic model and in, in particular the right-wing religious in America who, who are skeptics hiding as religious have, have created immeasurable damage in the world for nothing more than power. Frank, let, let me ask you this as well. Uh, when I mean, I always think the French Revolution is a very interesting topic because so much goes back and hinges on on, on that point. We have a during that time we have uh, you know the, the the creation, if you will, of uh, of the Illuminati, kind of hand in hand with with the Jacobins, which is by the Jacobin Club, which is a uh, another one of these revolutionary. It's uh, it's a far left political movement at the time, and of course they're against uh, church, they're against monarchy, and and although they're some of their arguments might be understandable considering how corrupt, if you will, the monarchy was. I wanted to ask you how you think that this kind of works in the in, in the current political spectrum, because certainly many people don't think about, when they think about the Illuminati, they don't think about uh, left wing, but certainly these revolutionary movements that are deconstructive and designed to destroy system, they come in all shapes and forms and, and they connect even with the Fabians. But so much of this goes back to the Illuminati, of course, but this is an organization, where would you put it today on the political spectrum, if we even can do that? Well, it's funny you should say it, because we can actually use prophecy and the different groups that came together in uh, claiming prophecy as a, as a way of distinction, distinguishing. But we need to, we really need to be clear on what is the Illuminati before we then make the distinction as to who is behind the insanity of the secularist movement right yeah. right because and that's a good point because there are so many different interpretations people also use the term illuminati very very loosely or as a definition of basically everything that you know they are against or, or has anything to do with conspiracy and uh i mean if you're strict to the word it usually means something very very different than what most people uh, you know what they actually mean when they use the word but go ahead i want to hear your how you connect okay. it. yeah so let, let's let's be absolutely ironclad clear who the illuminati are and then we can talk about who's behind the nihilistic madness of the world and that refuse, flat stick refuse to bring themselves to account. So the Illuminati, as, as some may know, uh, was formed uh, at least in name by Adam Weishaupt in, uh, in, uh, in Germany in around the time of 1776, and one may argue that there were remnants of it prior to that, and of course the strong connection to the Jesuit model. The Jesuits themselves having been technically, or at least on paper, disbanded three years earlier. Uh, so, so there are all these connections to its origin. So let's fast forward then. I don't want to go through that because that's time that we can talk about another time, and it's all well written on sites like one-evil.org. But let's fast forward to, to the last 50 years of what the Illuminati is today. And in 1961, there was an extraordinary event that took place in the reconstitution constitution, sorry, of the constitution and uh, rules of order of the sovereign knights of Malta, uh, Rhodes St. John. And what happened in 1961 for the first time in history, and really this is this is earth shattering when we talk about what the Illuminati is. In 1961, for the first time in history, you saw the amalgamation of a Catholic order with the Protestant order, so that the Protestant and Catholic elite for the first time came together under one structure. And, and the Jewish lodges that had a loose affiliation also came under the structure. So now for the first time we see Protestant and variations of Protestantism with Catholic and Jewish elite for the first time together under one structure. Mm -hmm. and, and lodges in the Middle East of elite Muslim families coming together. So for the first time in the history of this planet, first time, in 1961, a constitution rule of order comes together where we see Catholic, Protestant, 
Jewish and Muslim lodges coming together as one. Now in that document, which is available, it's publicly available, many, many places you can download it, you will see that the Sovereign Knights of Malta, which is the simplest way of describing their long-winded name, has three classes, a first class, second class of membership, and a third class of membership. The third class of membership are those that are generals of military, esteemed politicians, leading artists, Nobel Prize winners, heads of secret intelligence organisations and other leading business and industrialists of society. That's the third class of the Sovereign Knights, of the Illuminati. The second class is reserved purely for the heads of monarch families, queens, kings, emperors, sheikhs, and they're the second class. And then the first class, the class above all other classes, remembering this is a military and a religious order. So to be a member of the Illuminati is to swear a sacred and absolute solemn oath, both to a military and to a religious order, to become a religious. And could you imagine who the first class is? And it's in plain sight in their constitution. Tell us. It is the Jesuits. Now, it doesn't say the word Jesuits. It doesn't need to. It simply describes an order that is not required to be conventional, that is to live in habits and in monasteries, that has sworn a sacred oath to poverty, obedience, and chastity. Mm -hmm. and there is only one order that fits that bill, and you know who they are. So that is the first class of the Illuminati, and they're approximately, in the second and third class combined, they're approximately about 35 to 36,000 members around the world, and they are the most famous people, the most famous artists, scientists, politicians, business leaders, military, religious. Now, within the structure of the Illuminati since 1961, there are two major operational roles. There is the Grand Master, currently known as, uh, currently as Matthew Festing. Yeah. He is the Grand Master of the Order, and he is the public face, and there is a private public role as well being the Dame Hospitala. And this is in deference to that part of the Illuminati, that part of the Sovereign Knights of Malta that combined with the Protestant arm and the attendant Jewish and, and other arms. And of course, the Dame Hospitala in the Protestant movement, the Church of England, who might you think that is? Queen of England, uh, uh, Elizabeth II, right? Correct, absolutely. So they're the two public roles, but both roles report to the ultimate, ultimate head of the Illuminati in the world, the most powerful head of the Illuminati. It is a private, private role, and it is a purely spiritual role, and it is a purely guiding role, and given what we said about our misdirection on thinking that generals hold power rather than teachers, would it not surprise you that the role is a teaching role? Yeah. And it is the prelate. When we talk about the Illuminati, who exactly are we talking about? And so we spoke briefly about the order being three classes of members, the third class being the vast majority of members, prime ministers, ex-prime ministers, president, all the ex-presidents of the United States, the sovereign knights of Malta, President Obama, is now and, and will officially be recognised as a sovereign knight of Malta of the third class when he finishes. The second class are your kings and queens uh, and leaders at that level. And then the first class, as we said, are in fact Jesuits. And that's the structure of the sovereign knights of Malta uh, and the elite and the Illuminati today. 
So in terms of numbers, sheer numbers, as I said, there's you know, around 36,000 in total um, in the second and third class, and then there's about 23,000 thereabouts members of the Society of Jesus. So we're talking about 50,000 thereabouts members or 55,000 or so members of the elite, the true Illuminati, if you like, in the world. That's all there is. And the leader under the Constitution is not the Grand Master, Matthew Festing, that we mentioned, and is not the Dame Hospitaller. Both the Dame Hospitaller and the Grand Master confess to the prelate. The prelate is the head of the Illuminati. The prelate is the most powerful member of the Illuminati in the world. That is the position. As a teacher, as a guide, as a philosopher, as a theologian uh, to the elite. That is, that is who is the top of the tree. And who, who holds that title today? Well, it's a private title. Uh, it's a private position. Uh, it's given to the most uh, senior and esteemed teachers of the uh, Catholic Church. I presume it to be an honorific, that is, it's a title and a role that once appointed is usually until they die, as mm. opposed to uh, the rector of the Gregorianum, which may turn over in five years, six years or 12 years. Uh, so there's someone who has uh, obviously been at a senior level, like the rector of the Gregoriana Pontifica, the, the, the leading university in the world, uh, someone that is recognised as a, a leading theologian uh, and someone that is universally recognised, well, obviously has to be a Jesuit. Um, and uh, if they fit that qualification, then that's the role. Now, that role not only uh, is the spiritual head of the uh Illuminati, but may in fact also hold the imprimatur of the Catholic Church and the teaching power of the Catholic Church, the magisterium, is personified usually in a great teacher. And that role ultimately has the authority to imprint or deny even the Pope in publishing material. So there is indeed someone in that role and uh, they live, you know, pretty much in a, a fairly anonymous role in the world. The most powerful role in the world is virtually unknown. You could watch them go down the road, have a coffee or be on a, on a train or a tram and no one would know who they were. Well, that's how I kind of always uh, figured it to be. If, if we have the names of some of these people that we think are high up the ladder, I think we're we're missing the, the the point altogether. I think that we're talking about organizations that we well in this case we know the name of it of course, but if within these circles they are having secret meetings, not the Bilderberg meeting, but things we don't even you know we don't even have the names of these things. That's what I'm getting at, and we don't have the names of the people either. Well, certainly to the elite of the world, to the presidents and ex presidents of the United States, and 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 they are recognized as powerful people. Uh, the Queen and the royal family is certainly are the, the royal families of the world certainly hold sway. One one could 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 undoubtedly argue that those that are current heads of intelligence organisations and heads of the vast military network surely have influence. And all these people, all of them, report ultimately in the pyramid to this spiritual role, to this teaching role, the one that directs the past. And the interesting thing is it was this role that recognised the importance of change and this role with others that recognised the events that led to Benedict uh, standing aside, being asked to stand aside and agreeing to stand aside. An incredible role, an incredible change. And, uh, and the events that saw uh, a Pope coming in for the first Vicar of Christ since virtually 1100 CE. So what was the reasoning behind this, do you think? Uh, was it a, a, a political or political, but like a, a kind of a PR move because of all the 
shit that's been happening to the to the Roman Catholic Church as of late? Uh, yes. Look, things don't happen for one reason, so the answer is yes, but but then very, very much more than that. Look, the the people behind the the most dangerous people on the planet, by the way, and I have to say this, and people may may not believe it. I mean, it's up to them. It's it's up to people to choose. The most dangerous people on the planet are not the Illuminati. The most dangerous people on the planet are people who openly celebrate madness, psychopathy, a lack of logic, a lack of reason. When people have a little bit of knowledge, a lot of power, and are in an insular role, as are the nihilists and those that in the nihilist movement who claim themselves to be uh, the inheritors of spiritual revelation in the religious right in America, they are incredibly dangerous. And in fact, an alliance was formed between the Hasidic leaders and the Sabbatean leadership and the Mormon church and the religious right, the evangelicals. And that was called and is still called the uh, Zionist plan. Mm. Now that is not, it has nothing to do with labels. I'm not going to use a label that is used all the time. It's got nothing to do with a particular religion at all. It is an attitude, it is an attitude of people who have no foundation other than desperately wanting to seize and maintain power and who believe that they can continue to hoodwink the world by manufacturing what they claim to be messages from Lucifer. Well, I was going to actually ask you about that. I wanted to ask you what you think about the theory that very uh, high up in, in the hierarchy, uh, maybe at the highest point, but maybe somewhere around there, uh, that there are could be something that basically is not, not human. We can talk about an entity from another place, uh, Lucifer, a demon, even an alien or, or, alien, or maybe a, a channeled entity, something like that. What do you, what do you think? Well, I do believe that, that there is, in fact, a, a, a manifest spiritual energy at the top of the tree around these uh, members that are loosely affiliated in the false nihilistic quasi-Luciferian cabal that is formed from the leadership of the Hasidic, the Sabbatean, the religious right of America and, of course, the, 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 the Mormons that have come together and believe that they can pretty much sprout on a daily, weekly, monthly basis the duplicit claim that God speaks to them when really they're saying to, to other members of the elite, I have a message from Lucifer. And I do believe there is a, a spiritual influence that is, that is participating in this. But we're talking about people that have no genuine occult knowledge, none. It's all false. It was manufactured, completely manufactured. It is nihilistic in that they created it on the belief that they could herald their own greatness, their own brilliance. There is no real revelation or message. It is purely political. And that message, when it is harnessed with real revelation, and even the Zohar from the 15th century has some real revelation, that harnessing has been the central driving force for nearly a century of these mad, mad, mad people putting us in two world wars and desperate to put us into a third world war. Mm, yeah. <laughs> it's it's unbelievable, and, and it's funny too how... Uh... It seems like a lot of the orders from behind the scenes and, and in some regards even flat out openly have, have been involving, uh, you know, the sovereign military order of Malta and the connection to some of the private mercenary armies and such that has been continuing what has been known as the 10th Crusade, I think pretty much, uh, you know, since the uh, second invasion of Iraq. And this is now basically spreading throughout the Middle East. And, and I believe as well, Frank, that what we see with these uh, revolutions if you will, in, in, in Egypt and, and, you know, ongoing in so many other countries, Northern Africa and everything else, is just a continuation of that same uh, war, that 10th crusade. But it's being, 
it's it's very cleverly done. So it's believed that it's from a power that's within the country as opposed to an, an, an invading force from without. But it still very much is an invading force. That's what I see anyway. It is, but it's also um, cleverly done in, in the guise that people believe it is the Illuminati and that it is the um, Catholic Church and that it is this traditional hierarchy as opposed to a loose sham group of nihilists that that have members of that other order but really are perpetrating a fraud, a great fraud, where there is nothing behind it. Look, do you remember George Bush saying that he believed God spoke to him? Sure. Oh, yeah. Well, that was a double message. What he was saying is to the public God, in our vision of God, in the divine creator, but what he was telegraphing to the rest of the world and particularly to the old style, and, and, and we are talking then about the Illuminati, is that Lucifer, he was saying that Lucifer speaks to him directly. That's what he was telegraphing, okay? And that's the calling card of the mental illness and the absolute falsity of nihilists, that is, they don't believe it. There is nothing to it. They think they can con the world, and they have. They've absolutely conned the world. They've convinced the world that it's an old European-based influence that is that's driving the world, that it's malevolent. Meanwhile, they're all sitting in positions. They don't have the education. They don't have the inclination. They see power as a tool to play with and manipulate. They believe in absolutely nothing. And this is the most profound and dangerous force. And I believe a line in the sand was drawn in 2012 or earlier to say enough is enough. We're not going to allow what's called the, the Zionist plan, the Zionist dream to keep being the vehicle of this complete madness. And as I said, remember, I'm not using labels. If I'm going to use a label, I'll call them for what they are. Kazar, loose affiliation of nihilistic groups, quasi-Christian groups, false uh, history, Mithraic influences, but fundamentally sewn together with a central common theme of being nihilist. That's who we're talking about. Very, very interesting. Now, uh, Frank, in a little bit here, we're going to take a break and continue to talk more about this, of course, how to get even uh, deeper into much of this and, and to be able to, uh, you know, decipher what's going on in the world, uh, who are, you know, intending to take us there. And of course, what we can do to, uh, you know, break out of that, of course. But why don't we talk a little, little bit more about your websites? You have a, a lot of different websites out there. Of course, UK, I think most people will uh, know at least that heard uh, our initial program uh, about a year and a half ago, but uh, you have more uh, as well out there. So please give us all the URLs, what people can find there and such. Absolutely. On the subjects that we're talking about tonight, probably the most relevant website that I can give you is the website one-evil.org. That's one-evil.org. And when you get to that website, there are three links that I, I feel will, people will find most relevant. There is a link on the homepage, a graphic about prophecy and the importance of prophecy shaping human history, which is really the underpinning of what we've been talking about. There's another article there about nihilism, the 25 greatest lies of nihilism, which is still a work in progress. I think we've got uh, five or six more to load up there, but you, you get to see the mindset of the nihilist through the first, I think, 16 or so uh, lies and the arguments that they put up there. So that's one site, one hyphen evil.org, O-N-E hyphen evil.org. The other one that I'd, I'd love to share with people is one hyphen heaven.org. That's O-N-E hyphen heaven.org. And that website is really dedicated to revealing the history and structure and source of law. And so the two websites I'd love to share with people tonight. Very good. We'll uh, relay people there for, for uh, much more here. In the meantime, as we take a little break, uh, UKDA, of course, we're going to have that linked up. And then both of the sites, one-evil.org and one-heaven.org. 
Illuminati.org. Do take a look around. Some uh, interesting stuff there. And there's some uh, interesting stuff you can read about the Illuminati and connecting it, of course, to the uh, Knights of uh, St. John of Jerusalem and all these groups that we've been talking about. So do check it out. Frank, uh, we'll, we'll be right back. So stay with us. Continue, we will do for our subscribers at RedIceMembers.com. Our members website is jam-packed with programs going back to 2006. We also have uh, TV programs, other video and audio material, and we are working more on that right now as well. And as we proceed, we're going to talk more about the Jesuits, the new Pope, the Knights of Malta, and we'll get into some interesting concept about the fear of death and how reincarnation is actually a part of Christianity. And later, Frank comments on the OPPT, the uh, One People's Public Trust. All right, so much more to come. If you're not yet a member but want to listen to this or any of our previous programs, do check out RedEyesMembers.com. That's what makes all of these free programs coming and coming without commercial interruptions and an ad-free website as well. So if you enjoy it, do consider it. Thank you very much. All right, we'll talk to you on the other side. Thank you for staying with us.